The buzz around the British Museum has reached fever pitch as it opens its biggest exhibition in a generation. It's about the first emperor of China, one of the most important men who has ever lived and creator of the Terracotta Army. For over a year now, we've had exclusive access to the exhibition team from the earliest planning stages right through until the last minute preparations for opening. Right, nice and easy. You just get hand on the warrior. Your first sight of them has to be dropped dead at that moment. Mm. It has to hit you emotionally. For the first time, the museum's historic reading room has been transformed into a gallery. So the room is still a star. It is, isn't it's it? It's still expressed and, and within the exhibition. On display will be some truly iconic objects. He's the unarmored general. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? They look so real. It's the job of a lifetime for the curator. This exhibition's the biggest one I've ever done. I've done permanent galleries, I've done temporary exhibitions, but this is the biggest. Her challenge is to tell an epic story. The creation of an empire, the building of a great wall, the unification of a people. The first emperor ruled China for 11 years and built a lavish tomb to inhabit forever. The objects which the British Museum is gathering together will tell the story of the man who made China and his spectacular eternal army. God, that's breathtaking. The woman in charge of the first emperor project is Jane Portal. And this gallery is enormous. Um, it's the biggest gallery in the British Museum. And we have Jane is the curator of one of the best collections of Chinese bronzes, jades and ceramics in the West. But the first emperor's dynasty, the Qin, is a little underrepresented. I'm just going to show you what there is in the British Museum, which is from the Qin, which is here. We only have these three objects. This these, is it? This is it, yes. So no wonder we're getting excited about the <laughs> Chin exhibition. <laughs> and in fact, the Chin exhibition, we're having, you know, a large majority of everything there is to do with the Chin is going to be in our exhibition, because there isn't that much to do with the Chin apart from the um, evidence from the first emperor's tomb. That's why it's so important, the evidence from the tomb. Objects from the first emperor's tomb, including terracotta warriors, are being brought across the world from Xi'an in central China. This thriving city was once a great capital of the ancient world, like Athens, Cairo and Rome. Today, two million people come here each year to visit the Terracotta Warriors Museum. The Terracotta Warriors that were excavated in 1974 are really the most spectacular archaeological find in the world. In June 2006, after a year of negotiation, Jane visited Xi'an to select the items she wanted for her exhibition. She came with the director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor. What is so extraordinary is the sense of an army ready to, ready to, or actually on the march. They were hoping to secure 20 figures, more than had ever been loaned before. The design challenge and how you get some idea to the visitor in London of the scale of the site. If their exhibition can't convey the sheer size of the army, it might be able to give visitors a different experience. A face-to-face -face encounter with individual warriors, something which is only possible for VIPs in China. What's so extraordinary is to be able to look them in the eye, isn't it? And I think to give the visitor the sense of how big they are. And that's something that we can do in the exhibition that is not really possible for the visitor here. Mm. The exhibition is not just about the Terracotta Army, it's about the first emperor himself and the Qin dynasty. The Qin ruled the most westerly of several warring states for over 600 years before they conquered the others and united China. With designer Caroline Ingham, Jane embarked on a 900-mile journey around the ancient Qin state, searching for objects to display. Although the Qin was mainly known for its military abilities, we're trying to get over the fact that they actually made beautiful things as well. 
Now, I've seen pictures of them because they're very famous and they are incredibly impressive. But this will be a show which is about far more than a collection of objects. It comes at a time when the West is trying to make sense of the rise of modern China. That is, of course, exactly what the British Museum is about. The point was always that if you thought carefully about the past, you would be able to think differently about the present. This exhibition allows us to try to do something we really haven't done before, to think about what it meant to make China and how it came that one man was able to create what is the oldest political entity in the world. Every morning, this flag is raised in the heart of the capital here in Beijing, and it symbolizes one united country, and a pretty powerful one at that. It could all have been so different if it wasn't for the first emperor 2,000 years ago, who took seven separate kingdoms and created one state. The first emperor set the template for modern China. He centralized rule across his vast empire with ruthless organization backed by military might. He created an everlasting version of his victorious army. 7,000 terracotta warriors guard his tomb, ready to spring into action against the ghosts of his enemies. In his short reign of 11 years, the first emperor created a coherent society with strict laws governing every aspect of life. Maybe, can I have some mushrooms? Standard units of weight and measurement meant that business could be done fairly across the empire with a new single currency. He built roads linking the former warring states and fixed the width of cart axles so the ruts on those roads would be uniform. Famously, he secured his empire from barbarian attack with a great wall to the north, a wall rerouted and rebuilt by successive emperors over the next 2,000 years. on earth do you do justice to all this in just one exhibition? The first thing you want to ask is, you know, how did he, how did mm -hmm. he do it? This is where we're hoping to use this steely idea. Um, a rubbing... Many people are planning the exhibition, but it's Jane who has to work out how to tell the first emperor's story. How or where in all this can we try to address the question of what he actually believed mm. was happening? I mean, the, this is obviously related to an extremely complex belief structure of him after death. Do we, do we know what that was? It's not like Egypt, where there's the Book of the Dead telling no. you what happens no. to the, the dead spirit or the no. spirit. The only so the we just have to evidence we've got is the Shiji, which is, what which is would... the Book of History, which was yeah. written in the Han Dynasty, the following dynasty, and it's written by this Confucian historian. Yeah. And he describes um, the making of the tomb. But we've got no idea whether the emperor is in his tomb waiting for judgment or whatever. As far as we know, he's just going on doing forever, forever what yeah, he was doing forever. So forever. it is the life of this world just going on yeah. indefinitely rather than, as far as we can see, a different kind of world. We may never know exactly what the first emperor believed about life after death, despite the wealth of material found around his final resting place. Lots of people have heard of the Terracotta Army, but few realise they're actually just a small part of a giant necropolis, a kind of palace of the dead built by Qing Shi Huangdi for himself. And in the middle there is this very prominent uh, tomb mound. The Terracotta Army themselves are actually about a kilometre and a half to the east over there. And all over this area, there are pits that have been found full of other figures, animals and precious goods. The Chinese people have always known their first emperor was buried here, but there was no record of the terracotta army. It was discovered in 1974 when a peasant digging a well saw a pottery head looking up at him. The Chinese government began excavating, bringing in workers from a local commune and captured it on film. The first warriors went on display in 1979. This model 3rd century BC army is in battle formation. 
There are columns of infantry in different types of battle dress, and teams driving wooden chariots which have long since rotted away, each drawn by four horses. These are the faces of people that lived, loved, and fought over 2,000 years ago. And they're all the more important because they're the only Qin statues in existence. Only about 20% of the pit has been excavated. The columns stretch back much further with thousands more terracotta warriors still buried. And that's not the whole story. Close by is another smaller pit. Here, partially excavated are archers and cavalry and more infantry to support the main army. And there's a third pit, a command post for the army with high-ranking officers. There was also an ornate canopied chariot which had disintegrated with charioteers holding the reins. When you're lucky enough to make history programs, you come to a huge number of places and you see all sorts of amazing things and often you have to get terribly excited about them. But here, today at the Terracotta Army, I've been completely overwhelmed. This is the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. The exhibition is to be held in the British Museum's historic reading room. Now a public library, it was once the preserve of scholars, the engine room of British intellectual life. Chinese visitors want to know where Karl Marx sat when he wrote Das Kapital here. It's a marvellous tomb-like space, but converting it has been controversial. The books will move and a modern gallery is to be inserted into this grade one listed building. Head of exhibitions, Carolyn Marsden-Smith, has commissioned the exhibition designers. It's certainly a challenge, and it's something that we wanted the designers to take head on. It's a very different space to the kind of spaces that we would normally um, present an exhibition in. It's a unique historic interior, so it has a real personality of its own. And the museum doesn't want to hide that personality, it wants to show it off, as well as having this extraordinary exhibition in the space. So that's a very unique brief for the designers. What I do like about that... Stephen Greenberg's design company, Metaphor, has won the commission. We have an archer at the top of the stairs at the beginning. We have the other archer at the end, the painted one. And there's a lovely symmetry of... You arrive, you see the head of the archer, and, you know, you can just imagine leaving, people turning back down the stairs, and, you know... It's... So you're thinking you're going to move him from the side into the middle? Well, the moment he's there, he's Jane, which is quite him. nice, because he's facing out there. That's a real improvement on how we had it, was it last week when we were looking at it, mm -hmm. because you have to look at him as you go out, which is really yeah. nice. The key thing is the display of the terracotta figures. Mm -hmm. the, fact that the idea of allowing visitors to look the terracotta warriors in the yes. eye has now become it's integral right. to the design. What do I then see of the, the big wow? It's not the first wow in the show, of course, but it's the wow of wows. I mean, yeah. dare I say, maybe you even walk on the exhibition surface at that mm. point. If you walk on the same yeah, surface really as the objects, nice. really you know what I mean? Yeah. That change, yeah, you're on the surface, the one time we let you step on the same surface. Then you're really in amongst them. You're in amongst, amongst them, which is what we wanted all along. Yeah. In amongst them. Yeah, that's great. Because the space is 40 metres across, and it's such a strong space, you've got to do things that people actually notice in the space. And you have to start with this. You have to start with this great big thing. So if we peel the dome off for a moment, the exhibition is divided into two halves, with this piece up the middle, the monolith piece. This half is all about his life and works and achievements, and the other half is about his eternal life, everything that's been found in, in the archaeological dig and in the pits. I mean, what a marvellous challenge to be able to, to make an exhibition in a space like this, to do such a great story. I mean, it's a once-in-a-lifetime project. This is the steppe of Inner Mongolia, the northern border of the ancient state of Qin. The land still probably looks as it did in the days when nomadic warriors swept to and fro. 